Welcome to another edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast. I'm Captain Rick Riles. Listen, every week we take a trip around the state and we check in with the preeminent guides and fishermen in their area. Well, the problem is, along with everybody, this coronavirus has kind of shut everybody in the charter business down. So I said, hey guys, let's take a week off and let's do this. Tell me about your favorite fish how the fishing forum's going, what kind of shape you think the population's in, are we doing the right thing with our management tools, and give me a tip that'll help newcomers catch more fish. You're going to learn how to catch more of your favorite fish tonight. Hey, we're brought to you each and every week by Yamaha. Reliability starts here by Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth, by Nasara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation, and by Young Boats. You want the best in flats, bay, and offshore hybrid boats? You need to check out youngboats.com. And after you're done listening to the podcast tonight, hey, we'd really love to hear from you. What we'd really appreciate would be if you would subscribe where Wherever you get your podcast. Ask what keeps us going. So let's get started this evening with your dream vacation. I want to talk to my buddy Craig Sutton from Nassara Paradise Rentals, and there's a reason for that. When I was down there with him last summer, he was rallying all the guys, all the charter operators down there, trying to get them to go to release only on Kubera Snapper because he felt like they were putting too much pressure on him. I want to check in with him and see how his efforts are coming over in Nassara, Costa Rica. Captain Ricky, what's going on? Craigie, how we doing? I'm great, man. How about you? Oh, I'm doing outstanding. Hey, I got to tell you something. I went trolling for Spanish mackerel and bluefish this afternoon, right? You can only sit home for so long. So we're picking. We've got those Spanish trees. You know what those are? Have all little tube lures hanging off of them. You run them on a planer. Yep. yep. All right. So yep. we, we've got those out, and I catch a triple header of Spanish, and we're catching bluefish. We're having a big time. All of a sudden, both rods go down hard. Craig, we had trolled through a school of giant red bass. <laughs> Oh, my God. We had them on every hook. We had them on every hook. It was unbelievable. They finally busted off one of the rigs, and and, uh, we got some pictures with the other one. But how cool is that? That's something we certainly never would have seen 30 years ago. No, absolutely not. I remember when they potted out, couldn't hardly find one up in the creeks, the rivers. That's right. slowly came back. What a comeback they've made. They've come back like gangbusters they are doing so great and i'm so happy about it you think of the number of people now all the guides that uh, that love doing that all the fly fishermen all the surf fishermen just all the people in general that have so much fun off of redfish anymore listen here's what i wanted to talk to you about tonight when i was down at your place in nasara last year which as i've told you many times was my trip of a lifetime i heard you talking with a group of charter operators about how you were pressing for Kubera Snapper to be release only in Costa Rica. You still feel that way? Without question. Absolutely. Do you think that's a pressure thing, that you're putting too much pressure on them, or what do you think? I don't know that it's too much pressure, but I know we've slowed up on the big ones that we were seeing. You know, we've seen quite a big drop-off, and not as many of those big ones just ripping your line off as we were. And it seems like they've dropped in size we all had a meeting and talked about it greatly and we all decided to start releasing them i tell you costa rica is so far ahead in that game how many years ago did they go to all circle hooks for billfish oh my gosh ricky that was not mandated but it eventually was by the costa rican government but when they first came out in the late 70s Mm -hmm. the government sent a crew of people to go up and down the Pacific Coast and the Caribbean and show the charter captains how to use the circle hooks, how to rig them, how to tie the snell knot onto them, and subsequently how to properly release them. And it's been a huge success for Costa Rica. I mean, I don't know of any place in the world that's consistently better sail fishing than down there. Well, when did they when did they get the long lines out of down there? For the last 20 years, it's been kind of a, two steps forward and a step back the situation. They weren't enforcing the laws. And, you know, when Bish and Nassara first started, we photographed a seine net boat inside the 30-mile limit. And back then, it was 30 miles off the beach, and everything past that was their area. And came in, and we called the government. The government sent investigators out there the very next day, and we took them out there and caught them again inside. 
But the TV station came down to our place and did a big report on it. And I think it spent two years in the courts and it was kind of a joke. We were watching them set these nets. It's incredible the number of yellowfin they catch on these nets and the porpoises that die from it too. It's just it's a horrible experience to watch it. But but the government started enforcing those laws and then they pushed them out forty miles. Now three years later we're seeing the yellowfin, the big ones and Big Dorado have just really been extremely consistent. I sure hope you're as successful with Kubera as you have been with the tunas and everything else. That's for sure. It, I know your fishing down there is fantastic. Most of the guys here, Craig, use lobsters for Kuberas. Most of it's done in South Florida, and they they catch Florida lobster and use those whole. What's your secret over in uh, Costa Rica for catching them? Live bonita or live yellowfin? Really? Okay. We'll use blue runners if we have to, but by far the preferred bait is a bonita or yellowfin. Up to how big? Four to about seven, eight pounds. I mean, I've used some big ones, just had bigger bites. Wow. The wow. problem is you can't stop these fish. You yep. know, when you get a real big one, everybody thinks they go back in a hole. That's not true. They scoot along the bottom. Right. They go up over a reef and they cut you off on the backside. Sure. Yep. Everybody thinks that grouper have a hole that they live in and they come out and grab a bait and run back in their hole. No, they don't. All they've got to do, and I know you've seen it just like I have, all they got to do is get next to a piece of coral and, and flare that gill plate and wrap that tail and you're done. You can't pull them off. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Every once in a while I get people that will say these cabaras go back in the hole. I'm like, I've caught a bunch of them and I've never had one went back in this hole. No, no. I got a trivia question for you. Okay. Where was the women's world record Kubera caught? And I'm not positive this still stands, but I know it stood for a long time. Well, you know, I know one of those grouper records was off Fernandino by a lady. Mm -hmm. I've seen the picture in the Moore's grocery store, but, I, you know, I want to say, wasn't it off Mayport? Off Mayport, big ledge at Ponte Vedra Ground, 118 pounds, Berta McKendry. Isn't wow, that something? Nice fish. Yeah, but that doesn't nice ha- that doesn't happen off Mayport very often. We don't see a lot of Kuberas. Well, you know, Jimmy Gavin used to fish for them once in a while. Really? Yep. He used live lobsters too, and he swore that they like the full moon, which I kind of think they do. I mean, they're nocturnal feeders. I've been down there several times fishing for them around the full moons, and the current was just too strong for them. Yeah, yeah, that'll mess it up. There's no doubt. Craigie, as always, we appreciate it. I'm I'm counting on by next week. We're going to have turned the corner with this thing, and we're going to be back talking about current fishing events every day. I think at the end of this week, things are going to be turning positive. I'm counting on it, brother. I'm counting on it. All right, we'll see you on the ledge here soon. All right, buddy. That was Craig Sutton from Nassara Paradise Reynolds talking about their efforts to preserve their big Kubera snapper over here. Now let's drive down to East Central and check in with Jim Ross about one of the only fish I can think of that will never be under any pressure. How about the tarpon, Jim? You like them? (laughs) I really like the tarpon. You know, they are so loved and yet so hated at the same time. Yep. Yes, they are. Oh, but tarpon are one of my favorite fish. You know, I used to spend my weekends driving to the Keys and sleeping in the truck sometimes just so that I could sit underneath a seven-mile bridge or back a cut or somewhere and drift a mullet or a pinfish back in the current. And, you know, over the years, things haven't changed much, except that I'm too old to be sleeping in the truck anymore. I like a nice, comfortable bed now, you know? Yes, I do. (laughs) I am too. (laughs) You know, here in our Central East region, we've already had the tarpon show up. I mean, they're almost a month early, but we had such a push on that southeast wind that we had the last couple of weeks. We had such a push of warm water come up from the south. You know, generally this time of year, we're fishing between Sebastian and Zero, uh, even Fort Pierce, for those ocean-roaming tarpon. And they were all the way at Clea Linda, and now they're all the way at Ponce Inlet. So they're all the way at the north end of my region. And each year is different, but they are just an ocean athlete. They're an apex predator. And they will test you to the very fabric of your core. <laughs> yes, they will. Yes, they if, will. If, and, if, and, and if you doubt it, hook one and keep it hooked and actually land it. To me, they're a magical fish. 
that deserves the utmost respect, but it's a grudge match getting those fish to the boat. Oh man, I I spent eleven years guiding for him, Jim, and 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 on my days off, I fished for him. And and you're right, they're an addiction. But I got an interesting question for you that honestly just came to me out of the blue since we've been on the phone. Uh-huh. We put limits on red snapper, very restrictive, and what happened? They've taken oh, over they, all the they've reefs, come back. right? I mean, they've, yeah, they've, they've, ju- they've they come have. back in a big way. Oh, yeah, they've taken yeah. over all the reefs. Now they're way up in the water. They're crazy. We put limits on redfish. They came roaring back. But here's what's interesting, Jim. Think about tarpon. We've never taken them. And every year, it seems to me like their numbers are about the same. Yeah. Well, I don't think their numbers are the same because of the pressure that, that man is putting on them. You know, back right, right. In, in, the, in the early part of the century, you know, we did kill them and hang them up and then basically just throw them in the trash can or bury them under yes, a palm tree. Yes, we did. Tree. Yes, we did. Um, because we didn't really know any better and we right. didn't realize the value uh, as a sport fish that they have to the sport fishing community. But, you know, nowadays nobody keeps them. But I'll tell you. With the number of sharks that we have in our Ooh, waters these yeah, days, yeah. the predation factor is huge. In just the last couple of years, I've seen noticeably more shark attacks happening in my region. Yes, and, yeah, we all have. And one of the things that I've been really surprised about was the number of hammerheads and the number of great whites mm-hmm. that seem to prey on tarpon. Yeah, you would think as big as a tarpon is and as fast and as acrobatic that they could get away but they get eaten. Yes, they do. There's, there's no question. And uh, there is also no question that there's more and more of the Ridgeback Sharks, which is that group you described, the the Hammers, yeah. the uh, the Great Whites, the Bulls, the Makos. There's more of those since, you know, they're all protected. You can't take any more. And, and down in George Labonte's region, he's losing sailfish to them. Up here, all the commercial guys are crying that they can't get a big mutton to the boat. And, I mean, it, that's just the way it is. And, Maybe yeah, you're starting yeah. to see a drop since the sharks. I haven't tarpon fished for a few years, so I'm not sure I'm right about that. But they never seem to overload. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? It's kind of like the right, kind of like right. the porpoise dolphin, the you know the, the dolphin, and I don't mean the mahi, of course. I mean the porpoise type. They're not under any real predation, and there's no take of them. But they seem to maintain their own population. That's kind of like tarpon, isn't it? Yeah, it really does seem to be like that. That's strange, but it's a good thing. All right, I want you to help somebody. Catch a tarpon. Okay. Okay. What's the biggest mistake guys make catching their first tarpon? The number one and number two things, both are drag related, basically. The the very first thing is that most guys, in my opinion, run their drag much too tight on the initial few runs. I have found that by using a thin wire hook, I I personally use the VMC 7385 model circle hook in a 7 or 8 odd. But most guys want to run 8 or 10 or 12 pounds of drag pressure. And when you have a screaming tiger by the tail, there's got to be some shock. There's got to be some give. There's got to be something in there that allows that thing to absolutely lose its mind and go, you know, batty, and yet still stay on the hook. So one of the things I do is I only run about 3 pounds of drag pressure. It's enough to make that particular hook that I use penetrate very well into the tarpon. I don't hardly ever lose one. Our, our hookup ratio is around 75 to 80 percent with that hook, which in tarpon terms, that's, that's oh, that's excellent. Yeah, it's absolutely excellent. Most most, most of the time, you're you're happy with a 30 or 40 percent. Oh, back in so, the old back in the old four aught uh four aught four x treble hook days, we were happy with 10 percent. Yeah, yeah. And so I run a light drag because that fish is going to rip 100 yards. He's going to jump three times in the process. One of those will be a backflip, undoubtedly, where he lands back on the line. Yep. And you have to have some kind of give in there. And so that lighter drag allows them to just absolutely go berserk and yet not break you off because you're not stopping that fish. Secondly, the one thing that I recommend is, you know, guys will kind of drop their rod tip a little bit and and they call it a bow. I prefer to teach my customers, well, you know, before we get on the boat, I teach them how to stab. So when that fish comes out of the water, I want you to take your rod tip and stab at the fish and extend your arm as far as you can out towards it. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you drop your rod tip slightly and then slowly lift upwards and back to come back into the bend in the arc of the rod. 
And that does a couple of things. One, it, it releases the pressure at the maximum point of exertion, I guess, when he's leaping into the air. Two, by dropping the rod down just a little bit, any of those tip wraps that may have potentially occurred, you kind of eliminate that because you've got a straight line. You can then lift slowly back up into fighting the fish again and get the bend in the rod. And by doing that, we lose a whole lot less fish. And then the one last thing that we have to be extremely, extremely aware of is that tarpon know where every trolling motor, trim tab, <laughs> outboard skeg and prop are at. So, you know, a lot of us run bay boats. I run a, I run a bay boat. And that bay boat allows my anglers to be mobile and to move around the boat and to keep the rod tip well clear of anything that might break the line as that fish runs from one side to the other or darts back to the underside of the motor or the boat. Once you get a customer that realizes how to do those things, it's a lot harder for a tarpon to not come to the boat at that point. Makes perfect sense. Jim, that's an outstanding update on your tarpon numbers and very good advice for guys that want to catch their first one. Here's hoping that this time next week, we're going to be back to talking about everyday fishing and how things are going. And I don't know where the cobia got hung up between me and you, but there's somewhere where we can't find them. Well, if I get a chance to get out there and sniff around and I find one, I'll let you know. Let me know. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, buddy. You take care, Rick. Tonight's special edition of Florida Sportsman Action Spotter Podcast is brought to you by Yamaha. Reliability starts here. By Tournament Master Chum, the best chum on earth. By Nasara Paradise Rentals, your dream vacation. And by Young Boats. You want the finest in Flats Bay and offshore hybrid boats? You want to visit youngboats.com. You know what Yamaha Outboards love? The genuine formula and consistency of Yamalu Marine Engine Oils. Blood, 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 blood. Outboards are subjected to punishing conditions like high loads, salt, and humidity, a mix that automotive oils can't handle. Yamalu full synthetic and marine performance formulas are certified to protect against friction and corrosion for reliable performance every time. Ah. Find Yamalu Marine Oils at your nearest Yamaha Outboard dealer. Locate them at yamahaoutboards.com backslash dealers. Yamaha. Reliability starts here. Hey, Raj, you know, being consistent is a mark of a quality product. If you've been Florida's number one chum for over 10 years, there's got to be a reason. For 10 years, Tournament Master Chum has lived up to his name. That's why more tournament pros insist on Tournament Master than any other chum. It's the only chum with Menhaden milk mixed right in. That means it gets the scent out faster and deeper than any other brand of chum. It comes in a grind size for every species from kingfish to catch and bait. Your fishing time is way too precious to use second-rate chum. Bring the action to you by insisting on Tournament Master Chum. It's worth every penny. When you're ready for the finest in custom-made flat spay or inshore-offshore hybrids, you are ready to meet the Young family in Inglis, Florida. For over 21 years, the Young family has built custom boats one at a time for every type of fishing. Nothing can sneak up on a flat quite like the Gulf Shore flats boats, and I've never fished a better hybrid than the Young 24s and 27s. Rob Young is a naval architect who takes tremendous pride in each and every build for each and every customer that wants their boat custom-built exactly the way they want want it. Is it time for you to move up? Are you ready to own the finest boat built? Then you need to visit the Young Boat facility in Inglis, Florida, or check them out online at youngboats.com. Let's check in with Captain Alan Sherman. He's been dealing with an exploding fishery in his area, triple tail. Alan seems to me like everybody in Florida wants to catch a triple tail. Why not? They're excellent eating, and they hardly ever resist a, a bait that's put in the right spot. Yep, I understand. How uh, how much of an increase have you seen in the fishing pressure on them in the last few years? They've always been pressured throughout the course of time. Uh, during uh, the stone crab seasons, every year they will move in and hang out underneath the uh, crab trap buoys, and you know you'll see one. Sometimes you'll see three or four sitting underneath one buoy. So they're easy targets, and for ever people have been targeting them so it used to be you could keep up to like i think five per person and they had to be 15 inches in length but now in the last couple of years they've changed that and now you're only allowed two per person they have to be 18 inches so an 18 inch triple tail is probably in the four to five pound range that's a pretty large fish uh, whereas the 15 incher was was much smaller of course and when you caught one, there wasn't a, a lot, you know, when you flayed them to, to eat. 
So having them at 18 inches has definitely made that part better because we had so many undersized fish and uh, not enough big fish. So we're seeing bigger fish now. We're going to continue to see bigger fish each year uh, with these fish having an opportunity to grow bigger, spawn more. And uh, with the, the drop in the, the quantity numbers from five to two, that's going to make a huge difference as far as quantities that we see. One of the reasons I like them so much is because they frequent all three areas that I like to fish. And that's Biscayne Bay, Flamingo, Florida Bay, and then the ocean uh, as well. So almost every time I'm on the water, I, I stand a chance of uh, running into a triple tail. I think we see a lot more on the Florida Bay side, especially during uh, October through May because of the stone crab traps that are out there in the Gulf of Mexico and the outer edges of uh, Flamingo and Everglades National Park. But we do find them in North Bay as well, under crab trap buoys, along pilings, and uh, especially under docks uh, next to the pilings as well. And then in the ocean, you see them under floating debris and then under uh, sargasso weeds. So you can find these fish almost on any trip, regardless of whether you're fishing the ocean, fishing in Flamingo, or, or fishing in the bay. And they're great fun on, on light tackle. Uh, they'll eat a live shrimp, a small crab, a small bait fish, an artificial soft plastic, a small lure, and then as well as uh, an artificial fly for the fly fishermen. And uh, that's a lot of fun when you get one on a fly. Do you see many on your trips? Well, you know, we do, Alan, if we have the crab trap buoys out. We, the last few years, have had crabbers that the seasons just happened to line up real good. They would put their traps out in March and April, and that's when our triple tail would come through. And uh, we had a good fishery. Now, it, it can't support a whole lot of boats. And that's what concerns me, and that's what makes me so glad to talk to you because down there, apparently, you guys have fished for them a lot longer than our guys up here have. And we're just now starting really to put pressure on them, and it makes me nervous. But do you feel like the two per person, that's tight enough? Oh, for sure. I do believe that. And when you go from what it was, and I'm pretty sure it was five, and they were definitely getting annihilated especially in Florida Bay, in the Gulf of Mexico, there could be a million traps out there. And you could have dozens of guides running those traps. And if you ran the traps on a daily basis, you would find triple tail throughout the day. Some days they're on every trap. Other days, you know, you may have to run 100 uh, or 100 and a half to, to, to locate a few decent uh, fish that were legal. And, and then as soon as you did come up on a legal fish, you catch that and put them in the boat. That was like 15 inches or better. And now, being 18 inches, you're talking about a pretty large triple tail. Mm -hmm. So that fish is going to have many more years to grow and spawn. So each time that fish spawns, you know, you're getting thousands or maybe even a million more eggs in the water to hatch. So, yeah, I think that's not a bad number. And I think our numbers are going to start increasing as far as the quantity numbers of keepers that we're seeing. In the last few years, we've had to run a lot of traps to find illegal fish. I feel 100% better since talking to you, I got to tell you, about the future of triple tail fishing. All right, give us a tip. Somebody wants to catch their first triple tail. How do they right. do it? So what I do with my customers and, and myself is we're finding them on the crab trap buoys. There's usually a cart, and they'll be sitting right behind that buoy. So you need to get your bait in their face, but you don't need to throw it so that it lands on their head because it'll spook them every time. So what we usually do is I'll either drop my talon, which is a shallow water anchor, if it's shallow enough, and anchor the boat up current of the buoy and let our, our customers or even myself throw a bait down current so it drifts right into the fish's face. That's the simplest way. Otherwise, we'll throw a Cajun Thunder that's afloat with a short leader with a, a, a number four Mustad Ultra Point hook. And uh, live shrimp, I like to hook that from under the, the carapace on out through the top. You put that in the current, it's going to act almost natural. And I direct my guys to overthrow, to get past that crab trap buoy, so that it doesn't land too close to the fish and spook them. And as they, if they throw it past the buoy, they can reel it back on a steady pace until it, it goes right in front of that fish. Now, one of the things with these Cajun Thunder floats is they're large and they're colorful. And the, the triple tail always go after the float. <laughs> I've got some chewed so, up floats. I know what you mean. You're 
get chewed up floats, yes, but you have to be able to instruct the person or yourself to pull that float in fast enough so that it goes in front of the fish and then he sees the, the bait, whether it be a small pinfish, a crab, or a shrimp. And then once they see it, it's on, it only takes a second and they've got it. And then you've got it. And these fish, they fight, they, they run, they jump, and then you fly them, and they're excellent eating. Oh, you're, yeah, they're, so, a, they're a great, great fish, Alan. And I've only started fishing for them in the last couple of years, and, and I'm thoroughly in love with them. Cap, I, th- I want to thank you so much. All right, take care. Let's come on around the state and talk with one of my favorite people, Captain Steve Dahl in the 10,000 Islands. He's going to tell us what triple tail fishing's like down there. Hello, Steve. Hey, what's going on, Rick? How you been? Everything's fantastic, man. Everything's great. How about yourself? Oh, about the same. No complaints. Good, good. All right. Tell me about triple tail down there. How many years have you been fishing them? Gosh, I'm in my 26th year of taking people fishing. It's such a cool fish in its simplest form. I, I call it a hybrid between like a world record black crappie, <laughs> yeah, a bear mundi, yeah, and when large enough, they've got that rope forehead like a decent sized snook, yeah, and that's the physical attributes to that. So that's intriguing in its own right. As easy as they are to catch, sometimes they're just so unpredictable, and honestly, we don't really know a lot about them. I mean, they're a, they're a free roaming pelagic fish. They set up a lot of times very close to shore. They've been found in estuaries and passes down in our area. You know, they'll relate to standing timber laydowns, and it's not even a pattern. <laughs> it's boom, there's one. Why is it there? Some years, this certain navigation marker holds them. Some years, certain crab trap lines hold them, and it's just. If it was easy, everybody would do it. That's right. Know? And I just love that unpredictability about them. Even when you've got to, kind of got them honed in, and sometimes it takes 15 casts to, to get them motivated, or sometimes you got to mark it and come back to them. You know, you and I have talked this year. We've had an off year here. We had a gangbusters front half of the season for triple tail with lots of fish over 10 pounds, and boom, it just all kind of disappeared. We're seeing some small ones, but I'm hoping this last push and, you know, with obviously everything going on in the world is a little bit less fishing pressure uh, this time of year. And, you know, maybe that'll help. I don't know. Steve, I have seen them in Clapboard Creek, which is almost brackish water, uh, sitting on a crab trap buoy. And I have been a 120 miles offshore sword fishing and had them come up in the lights at night. So I, I'm with you. I, I don't know what their range is. I don't know where they go and why they go there and how on earth you'd ever find one on a palm frond floating 80 miles offshore, but I've done it. Yeah, I've caught them off a five-gallon bucket, a pallet. I've caught them off a palm frond. I've caught them off a mylar balloon. <laughs> it's like, crazy. It's crazy. What kind of shape do you think the population's in? Are we doing enough to protect them? I do. I think I think we have the size of the fish has certainly increased over the years. And I think a couple of years ago when we went from the 15 to 18 inch size limit, that certainly helps. There's a lot of fish under 18. And we're seeing some fish in the mid 20, 30 inch range. I mean, there's some giant fish out there. I mean, there's 20 pound triple tail swimming on our waters. I would really like to see it be just one a person. If cleaned properly, I mean, a, a decent sized triple tail is a lot of me. And mm. albeit it, it does freeze well, don't get me wrong, but you know, fresh fish is the best fish. We all know that. So, you know, if you can feed your group, you know, with one, I'm pretty happy. I'm not a catch and release guy. It's all right with our regulations to be able to harvest fish, but I also think it's our responsibility as anglers and more so as captains to be able to educate people that selective harvest is working. You know, all too often the the measure of success is what's hitting the play table as opposed to what the experience was. So I think all that being said, we have a lot of like-minded people like that. And I think uh, that's happening. And when collaboration, obviously, with what FWC's put forth, I think it's working. 
but I'd love to see them drop it down to one. Drop it down to one. Yeah, I'd, I am so proud of a young man that I've, I've kind of mentored. Uh, his dad passed away way too early, and he sent me a picture the other day of, of six people standing there holding up a cobia. I said, great trip. And he said, yeah, we got 13. And I said, um, okay. And, and over here in state waters, it's two fish per person. And I said, okay, uh, what happened to the other seven? He said, we let them go. You and I both know the limit should be one per person. So on my boat, it's one per person. You know, that proud moment you get as a dad, you know, yeah. <laughs> just, I was just like, ah, that's my boy. That's my boy. Exactly. <laughs> Is it no, sir, no. Cap? If it should be one person on, on one per person on my boat, that's what it is. I liked it. No, that's wonderful. That's good news. Give me a good way for guys that are starting out to find more triple tail. Wind and tide have a great effect. And I see a lot of people set up on um, fish. What I mean by set up, you know, if you're cruising along, you see one, you turn around with your boat. When I'm guiding, I don't use the trolling motor. I just use the big motor and kind of coach from the helm. If I'm fishing by myself, I'll drop the trolling motor. But approaching it, you know, so that you get, you know, the wind and tide doesn't, you know, blow you onto it. Albeit, you're probably going to have to, you know, cast into the wind a little bit. You mask so much noise by doing that. Um, that's one common mistake I see a lot of people do is they, they kind of set up on the wrong side of the wind, if you will. And, um, that'll help you exponentially. It'll, it'll also help you control your boat a lot better too, but just go after the little ones to hone your craft and, you know, practice your boat control. Got it. And, and I think I would add to that, uh, what just occurred to me, if you always set up upwind and cast downwind, yeah, it's going to be a lot easier for you <laughs> than, than trying no, to no. throw that shrimp into the wind. Yep, it will. It will. It's just you run the risk of not controlling the boat. Is it? I kind of do it the hard way. I kind of point the boat into the wind a little bit. And, oh. Uh, no, I do. It seems to, you can kind of hold your position a little bit better. You can actually get a little closer, I think. I really believe that. And that's the way I've always kind of done it, and it's worked out pretty good. And once you cast past the buoy, I kind of tell people to water ski the, the bait. Generally, it's a shrimp, mm-hmm. um, and water ski it um, so it's about two feet from the buoy, and then just stop, and then it just kind of naturally goes with the wind and the tide, as opposed to the other way, the bait's kind of going away from it. So it's almost like a drive-by shrimp. So Makes perfect sense, Steve. Makes perfect sense. Right. Thank you so much. That's a great tip, and and I'm kind of with you. I'd be okay if they go from. Uh, Two triple tail over 18 inches to one would be just fine with me if it meant we all got to catch more triple tail. Yeah, I'm with you. Thank you, Steve. All right, have a great week. Talk to you next week, buddy. Let's move on up to the West Central. uh, Let's move on up to the West Central District and check with our buddy Ray Markham. Ray, are you with us? That's easy for you to say. Easy for me (laughs) to say the West Central section. There we go. (laughs) Now we got it. All right. Yeah, tell- I've heard there's a lot of people drinking these days for all this <laughs> stuff going on. That's correct. That, I've knocked down 800 Coronas, and I still don't have coronavirus. I don't know what's going. That's not true, by the way. But um, tell me about Trout and West Central uh, section. Are they coming back after your horrible red tide? How does the population look to you? Well, the West Central region basically covers from. Uh, the south end of Citrus County all the way down to uh, pretty much south end of of Sarasota. And within that whole region, we have a number of different kinds of uh, habitats, if you will. And so one one area that's really well populated with trout is the north region. And of course, the northern uh, portions of our region, basically from Clearwater all the way up to uh, um, Bayport, Wikiwachi area up there, They have a great habitat. They had no issues with red tide a year or two ago. But whereas the south region from uh, Bradenton south, they they got hit pretty hard. The area down there is slowly coming back. They are seeing more fish. They are seeing bigger fish. And right now, between basically the end of March and and, uh, beginning or middle of May, is typically our best time for seeing a lot of big trout. And they pretty much have started moving in here. And I've, I've seen a lot of pictures of some uh, nice trout, but I have not caught personally 
a lot of big trout. Now, for me, big trout was not an issue at all before the 2010 mess that we had. Between freezes and red tide, I mean, my biggest trout way back when, after it barfed up a needlefish about a foot long and spewed out about a row, was burying my 15-pound boga grip. So I honestly don't know Holy if it was over the smokes. That's a big one. not. Yeah. And that was my backyard down, down near Teresia. Since they changed the rules and regs on on commercial harvest and uh, the freeze way back when, I have not seen the big fish like we used to have. However, I will say this about that. In the majority of the area that we cover, you're still looking at a closure on trout. You're still looking at closure on snook and redfish. And quite frankly, with a lot of what's going on lately, guys are, are not in some areas, able to put their boats in the water because the boat ramps are closed. So that kind of leads a lot of people to do some land-based fishing, fishing off of piers, fishing off of docks and seawalls and bridges and things like that. Uh, I spoke with Rick Grassett here uh, this morning. Rick runs out of Sarasota area, and the majority of of the boat ramps down south there, particularly in, in Manatee and some in Sarasota County, have been closed because of people who have abused the rules of uh, staying, you know, boats 50 feet yep, apart, usually uh, people is. 60 feet apart, yep. et cetera. So and always a few bad apples always spoil it for the rest of the barrel. But they were forced to do that. But still, Rick does and always has done uh, a lot of night fishing um, with some of his clients. And and quite frankly, you know, that that's an awesome time in, in the summertime to fish because it is cooler. And there's a whole lot less boat traffic on the water. But with people not being able to launch unless they actually live on the water or something, that he says he's seen a lot more people fishing off of the bridges where they have uh, dock lights and uh, fender lights that attract trout, attract snook. And it, it's been really difficult for him and his clients sometimes to get fish around some of those areas. With a lot of this stuff being cut off, a lot of the businesses out on the beaches where uh, the waterfront homes are, those businesses are shutting off their lights because they're they're not open. So it, it kind of created some interesting issues, and, and I think it's changing some of the patterns of how people are having to fish. But make no mistake about it, when all this is all said and done, the people are allowed to go back on the water. They open up snook trout and redfish. We're going to have the best fishery you, you've probably seen in the last 30 years. Oh, I so. like that. So what do you feel about the current limits? Are they are they where they should be once the fisheries open back up? I mean, do you like the, the one fish over per boat, or how do you like it? Although they've instituted the new size limit, the only place that it really is having any effect will be basically from Fred Howard Park, which is actually south of where our closure is, all the way south. So we haven't had any kind of situation where, you know, people would have to adjust to the new size or bag limits of three fish up to, you know, 15 to 19 inches with one over 19. Uh, Now, the people to the north of us, they can still go with five fish limit. And I think they've also gone down to the 19 inch max with one over uh, with no no captain's uh, catch being able to be added to anything. So... I think it's going to make a difference, but honestly, I, I think by the time they get around to opening it up, if it stays closed through uh, uh, May of next year, I, I think you're going to see a completely different story than, than what we've seen. Uh, trout can spawn six to eight times uh, a year anyway, so we're going to see a lot more numbers, and hopefully we don't have any issues with red tide, which we haven't. So it's all good as far as I'm concerned. Good deal. Well, give me a good tip. Give me a reason why – Guys haven't yet caught their one big fish, their 23, 24, 25-inch fish. What's key to catching that size fish? I think the majority of the time it happens to be that people don't fish where the fish are. Some people get the idea that they're always in either uh, a channel or deep water or something like that, when in fact a lot of times a lot of these big trout are just plain loners. They are not like any other trout that you're going to catch. They don't act like that. In fact, they act more like snook than they do anything else. They are a predator, and they are an ambush predator when they get to be that big. They don't do stupid things. <laughs> they put themselves in positions where they don't have to work for food, number one, 
they let it come to them. So being a, an ambush predator, just like snooks, they will put themselves where they've got some current, they've got some bait and whatever other kind of food source that they're eating and, and they just chow down. Guys need to put themselves and think more like fish than, than versus, well, I can't get my boat over there. They need to get out of the boat sometimes because some of those big fish are in, in knee deep in shallower water. Aha. Uh-huh. All uh, right, that's an outstanding tip. Don't be afraid to get out of your boat. and You make a much smaller profile. And uh, I've always felt like a long cast was really valuable for catching bigger trout. Do you agree? It, it definitely is. And this still going back to my days when I was throwing mostly monofilament. And we're looking probably at the early 90s, late 80s, prior to braid really coming in and taking over but the braid situation has really really lengthened the cast of most anglers when they've been able to throw line that is a fraction of the diameter of the same pound test of monofilament and um, they get more packed on the spool and you can just make a much more uh, effective cast that's going to be more effective at catching fish stealth is everything Perfect, you know. perfect. Ray, thank you so much. That's great news. Uh, you're obviously optimistic about the future of trout in your area, and you just made me that way. I appreciate it. We'll talk with you next week if that's okay. Well, come back down and fish with us again. I'll do that too. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. Don't threaten me with a good time. We'll talk soon, buddy. <laughs> we'll catch you later, Rick. Now let's move on up to Captain Kevin Lanier as we start out west, and I t- got to tell you, this is going to be funny. I asked Kevin what he wanted to talk about Red Snapper, and everybody in Florida's got something to say about Red Snapper. Kevin, do you have any Red Snapper up your way? Oh, good Lord, we got Red Snapper. (laughs) We got Red Snapper all over the place. My goodness. It's amazing. It's incredible uh, what they've done in both the Gulf and the Atlantic. And I got a question for you. You ready for this? I'm ready for any question. Okay, here we go. Many years ago, we really put a hurting on the Red Snapper, right? Yeah. And we knocked them way down to where the point was where we had to have some regulations and we put in some real tight regulations and they came roaring back and now their numbers are pretty ridiculous, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. I think they're probably as high as they've ever been. Okay. And, and I don't know about you, but I feel like they're almost taking over the ecosystem on most reefs. They are the apex predator and they've wiped it out and they continue to spawn and continue to spawn and their population's just exploding. Can we agree on that? Yes, we can agree on that. All right. Then let's look at another species. Let's look at tarpon. We've never really taken tarpon. I mean, some of the guys took a few back in the day, which we shouldn't have take pictures of. But isn't it interesting how they've kind of kept themselves in check? They don't explode like Red Snapper and suddenly take over the whole river, do they? No, no, you make a good point there. I have no idea. I don't either, but it's interesting and fascinating to me. So what's the story on your red snapper? What should the regulations be? I think that we are in good shape regulation-wise. Here's my main issue with the red snapper regulations in the Gulf of Mexico. I believe personally, and this is the world according to Kevin, (laughs) that red snapper, (laughs) our red snapper seasons are set for tourists and money versus uh, in the best interest of the fish. Okay, why do you say that? We all know that red snapper have a major spawn in the June-July time frame, and that's when we fish for them. We don't catch a single red snapper that doesn't have eggs in or, you know, a male. They're they're getting ready to spawn versus a spring fishery and a fall fishery. I think we hit them hardest when they're spawning, and we get a very small period of time that we can catch them. I think if we spread it out a little bit more over the summer, and into the spring and the fall, I don't believe we'd do any damage to the red snapper population, especially if we kept the limits uh, where they're at. Okay. Now, right now, you get to fish how many days in the Gulf of Mexico for snapper? In 2020, it's proposed that recreation will get 45 days and federal charter will get 60 days. Okay. Here's my thought, and tell me what you think of this idea. How about one fish, 20 to 24 inches? year round i guess i would say my problem with that is i do it for a living and one of the big draws down here is red snapper fish right people would have i believe i don't know i mean you never know you never know until you put it in front of people but you got to give me other things we can't have a month of amberjack and a month two months of trigger i mean it's gotten ridiculous i mean we have to have a 
I have to have my phone app with me when I go because, you know, I have to look it up a lot of times. I think sensible regulations throughout a, you know, period of time in the year is, you know, I don't know that I would ever sell the farm for one fish limit, but um, I think we can be reasonable. I think we're a little tight right now, uh, especially on the east side. I think there's a balance. We haven't found it yet. We have too many red snapper. Thought you'd ever say that. We have the same problem with trigger fish. Yeah, and I can't figure out trigger fish because I've had the biologist tell me more than once that trigger fish are the bottom fishing version of mahi. They start to spawn when they're eight inches long and they spawn nonstop their entire lives and they live a short lifespan and they're gone. And to me, when you've got a fish like that, the idea of putting in a one per person limit is really silly. Yes. In fact, this past week, we had uh, three guys on the boat, got three triggers, and two of them were right about 19 inches at the fork. I mean, we've got to be 15 inches at the fork. Yeah, 19 inches to the fork's a good trigger now. Yes, it is. It ain't really nice. That's crazy. (laughs) So, yeah, I hear you. So, what you would do is you would spread it out for more days and get it off of the spawn. Is that right? Yes. Because if you give guys more days, some guys will fish it every day, but then people don't have that pressure. You know, you get that spring and fall season. A lot of people are back to work and back to school. You're not going to get the pressure there, but we have a longer season. You know, mm-hmm. you look at it for residents in the state of Florida that you know are down here. It'd be wonderful to have fall season snapper or spring season. I see. No, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. That's outstanding. All right, Kevin. Give me one tip for guys that they're coming down, they want to catch their red snapper. Give me a good tip for guys to to catch more red snapper. What do you see most people do wrong? I think guys need to spend time catching bait. I think guys uh, are too quick to go to the storm by the frozen bait. I don't take anything away from our tackle shops. They're wonderful. But my biggest red snapper always come on live bait. What kind of bait? Pinfish grunt. Pinfish probably the best. Pinfish, huh? They gobble them up. No, they eat them up. They, you can put anything down in front of a big red snapper. He's going to eat it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But uh, croakers are, are one of my favorites here on the East Coast. You put that fish down there and let him croak at that big red snapper and see how fast he gobbles him down. Let me give you one more other tip. I think a lot of times don't be too afraid to go with a big hook. I mean, we'll use eight and ten hooks, you know, all the time. And those red snappers' big mouths are big enough. Yes, sir, and it'll it'll eliminate a lot of your little fish, too. Kevin, as always, we appreciate it. Thank you, Captain Rick. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you next week. Almost everybody was pretty happy with the regulations. Now, not Kevin Lanier. He doesn't think our red snapper are dialed in quite right, and he's right. It's a balancing act. We haven't found it yet. Ray Markham, very optimistic about the future of trout in his area. Triple Taylor on everybody's mind. Steve Dahl says that they're doing pretty good. So did Alan Sherman. Both of them applauded the raising the size limit to 18 inches, and they would like to see it go to one. Jim Ross and Tarpon. Why don't Tarpon ever over explode? Why doesn't their population explode? We don't take any of them. They just seem to stay in balance. I wish all our fish would. Craig Sutton from out in Nassara Paradise Reynolds. He was talking about Kubera Snapper with us tonight because he personally in his charter business down there is getting worried that he's not seeing a lot of 60, 80 pound fish anymore. Costa Rica is fabulous at taking proactive stances. They're going to shut down that Kubera Snapper, make it all release so those big fish can be allowed to prosper so overall things sound pretty good you know anglers attitudes have a lot to do with this so if you think that we've got limits too high on a certain fish like take mahi for example i think we may be taking a few too many so for my guys fishing on my boat five's the limit not 10 like it is for everybody else cobia you get one on my boat that's what you get so you see a lot of captains setting up their own limits and saying i think the limits are too high we're going to abide by a little tighter limits it's a new day of fishing in florida there's no doubt there's a great conservation ethic among our younger generation i for one am so glad to see it and i'm going to see you next week when we come back with another edition of florida sportsman action spotter podcast the podcast is brought to you each and every week by yamaha reliability starts here by tournament Man- Master Chum, the best chum on earth, by Nassara, Paradise Fishing, your dream vacation, and by Young Boats, you want the finest in flats, 
bay and offshore hybrids, you need to check out youngboats.com. Gosh, we hope you enjoyed tonight's podcast. If you did, do us a favor and give us a shout out. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, and even better, subscribe to us from wherever you get your podcast. As for me, I'm Captain Rick Riles, and I'm already looking forward to next week when we do another Florida Sportsman Action Spotter podcast. So long. 